I'm James Beckwith, President and CEO of Five Star Bank. As a community bank, we believe that open dialogue about the issues affecting our region is vitally important. From the economy to the environment to social issues, we look forward to the conversations and hope you'll join in. Edie Lambert anchors three of KCRA 3's evening news programs. Lambert has won numerous awards, including an Emmy for a documentary on breast cancer and has been selected as Sacramento Magazine's Reader's Choice for Best Local Reporter and then Local Anchor. Lambert resides in Sacramento with her husband and daughter. Edie, welcome to Studio Sacramento. Well, thank you so much. Very honored to be here. Well, you just got back from the uh, Democratic National Convention. What can you tell us about the state of our national elections from what you saw and what you experienced there? Well, it is, I don't know that you can necessarily extrapolate from being in a city with the absolute most die-hard, passionate, enthusiastic people involved in the process, because of course that's what delegates are mm -hmm. from all 50 states, and they're there to support, in this case, the president's re-election campaign. So you see a lot of energy, a lot of passion, people really fired up, and I don't know mm -hmm. that that's the case on the national level with, with elections in general but that's certainly what you see at a convention. Now, for the people that were there, one of the, the, the commentaries that has been going on is that this is a subdued electorate and that both on the Democratic side and the Republican side that the national parties are a bit subdued, neither completely excited about their choices. Did you find it down in Charlotte that that was true? Or, and what about... Um, Galston's trip down to the RNC. Right. It, it's interesting as you try to measure the level of interest and the level of passion, and to some degree it can be considered subjective. Mm -hmm. There are some objective metrics, for instance, fundraising. There's never been more money raised for a uh, national presidential race. In fact, they're calling this the billion dollar presidential race. Really? In part because of court decisions that have opened up some of the fundraising for super PACs. So one, if you look at it just in terms of numbers, you could say, well, there's never been more interest. Um, there are people writing enormous checks right now. Uh, one of the things that I found, so I personally, again, was only at the Democratic National Convention, but was very interested to talk to reporters who had covered both, just for a point of comparison. And one thing that I heard very consistently was at the Republican National Convention, when you really felt a lot of passion, it was that delegates really don't like President Barack Obama. They do not like his policies. You have words like Obamacare come up and that's when the passion just ignites. They want him out. Mm -hmm. Is there that much passion for Mitt Romney? People really weren't seeing that. Whereas at the Democratic National Convention, I think you did see a lot more passion and support for President Obama and clearly for his policies, it's, but mm -hmm. not the same as four years ago. Mm -hmm. And and one sort of comparison that, that I thought of while I was there was a little bit like dating. So four years ago, we didn't really know Barack Obama. And just as when you've started a new relationship, you can project all of your hopes and this person is perfect. And after dating four years, you know, maybe he leaves the toilet seat up. Or you know, I'm not saying that, <laughs> I'm not casting that aspersion on the president. You However, get to see bedhead in the well, morning, right? right. You, it's, it's the reality uh -huh. of the situation. Mm -hmm. And um, so, and, and he himself has said that he is a more humbled man four years later, and he knows how difficult it is to, to do that job. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think that this convention was very, very different from what we saw in Denver with a cheering stadium full of people and, and, and hope. Mm -hmm. was the big message. Well, you know, it's interesting you talk about the cheering crowds. Uh, one cynical observer said that for every delegate at both of the conventions, there were 10 reporters. <laughs> <laughs> and that it was more like the Democratic News Convention and the Republican News Convention than for the political parties themselves. As you had a chance to talk with fellow journalists from around the country and around the world, what struck you about 
just the amount of coverage because there it seems that there are two conversations going on at once one is is that there's a constant sort of wailing about the lack of political or policy coverage in this country and that news organizations like yours are shying away from that on the other hand at least at these two events it seemed that journalists were everywhere do you have any thoughts on that are we seeing less coverage well, uh, it's hard for me to quantify overall. Mm. I know for KCRA, uh, working as part of the Hearst team, that they have committed in writing to quantifiable political coverage every night. So we, we have to hit certain numbers. We have to give our viewers a certain amount of coverage. And the reason for that commitment, obviously, in a democracy, these, de these decisions are really important. Mm -hmm. People need to be informed. They need to know who they're voting for and why, what, what the issues are. So we're very committed. I mean, that, that's a central role of the media in a democracy. On a local level, do you see that interest as you go about your daily life and the, the folks that watch you every night come up and talk with you, do you see that interest from them in terms of what they want to see reported on? I think so. I got a lot of just personally really fantastic feedback from viewers um, during and after the convention. And I think um, in part, we didn't do the, hey, look at the souvenir story. Mm -hmm. We did stories, for instance, on Labor Day, which was the day before the convention started, looking at labor influence, union influence on the Democratic Party and vice versa. Unions feeling embattled right now uh, on a number of fronts looking at fundraising, which of course is always an enormous issue in campaigns, and the Democrats are behind right now and why that is. And so we looked at some very substantive issues going through That's an interesting. That's an interesting insight because when that case you referenced earlier, the Supreme Court decision in Citizens United, the expectation was is that there was going to be almost like an old time Soviet Union, United States nuclear arms race where both of them were equally empowered and there'd just be mutually assured destruction. And the, the common thought was big business would, and wealthy individuals would come to the fore for the Republicans and that labor and some wealthy individuals like a George Soros or something like that would do the same for the Democrats. But in terms of the conversations that were going on back at the convention, um, did the Democrats feel that they're not quite keeping up on that? Absolutely, they they admit that they are they are not able to raise the amount in the super PAC level mm -hmm. um, that that the Republicans are able to, and that the unions. And you have to keep in mind also that for unions, they're fighting many of them their own battles in their home states, including California. So they're spending millions of dollars on union-specific initiatives and other candidates, and they're not solely focused on the presidential race. So in other words, their resources are... So they're kind of fighting for survival. That's how they feel. That's how they feel. Now, you're a poli-sci major before you got into broadcasting. Yeah. Where does this passion for all this research and analysis that you do, where, where's that come from? It's interesting because my parents are marine biologists, but they were also uh, very focused on politics. My mom would have coffee clatches mm -hmm. at our house for local city council, and she had a friend who was running for mayor, and my parents always had yard signs up. My father was really self-taught in terms of philosophy and political philosophy, really? but, um, yeah, there were always very interesting conversations about the role of government. My dad grew up very, very poor in La Jolla, hmm. and that really informed his sensibilities in terms of how uh, government should be structured. And, and what about your sensibilities? How did you grow up? Well, watching, watching my parents going to the polling place, and I guess if I had one prevailing feeling is that it was just really important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that you had to get involved, that the decisions you made had profound consequences. Politically, I think I'm, I'm independent from, from my parents and mm -hmm. have certainly done a lot of my own thinking sure. on, in terms of where I stand. And I have to say, you know, people 
are constantly criticizing the media for, for bias. We watch that in ourselves. We watch that in our own work and we have gatekeepers within our newsroom who are watching for that as well. So I want to put that out there. There just seems to be, I'm sure you hear it as well in the media. It, oh. it, we're, we're a very common target. Oh, oh sure. Now you were, you were raised on an island. Partly, correct? Yeah. Partly? Mm -hmm. And that's uh, San Juan correct. Island? Mm -hmm. What was it like growing up uh, in that sort of, it, for many of us, a very remote kind of rural existence? What was that like? It was pretty ideal, I have mm -hmm. to say. Um, it, where we were on San Juan Island, it's technically in the town of Friday Harbor, but there's a whole area that's a marine lab. Uh, connected to the University of Washington. So both of my parents met there as grad students and fell in love, got married. Um, I was raised there um, for the first few years and then we went back on an academic schedule. So I spent all my summers there. And the feeling of, uh, we, we lived in Southern California for nine months out of the year to drive up as, as a family three days in the car and to get to the Friday Harbor Labs and just, I remember that feeling of just freedom, the, the opening the door Mm -hmm. The air smells great, and we were just basically turned loose for the summer. Wow. Yeah, it was, it was a pretty great way to grow up. Mm -hmm. And where did you first get the journalism bug? Where did that happen? In high school, I signed up for the high school newspaper because I have always loved to write. And it was a different group of friends involved in journalism, and I just thought they were so smart and so funny. And I loved that hour of my day of mm -hmm. just people who were constantly cracking jokes about what was going on. I wouldn't say in the world, but in our community and certainly in the school community. Mm -hmm. And the first time that I ever, I guess maybe focused on the journalism of it was uh, doing a story on a teacher at a competing high school and the principal from that school called our principal and said, you can't run this story till after our school newspaper has run this story. And all of a sudden, I'm in the principal's office arguing for my, <laughs> I don't even know what- Your right, constitutional what, what, freedom of the press, right? Made, yeah, whatever rights <laughs> I made up at the age of 16, but right. it felt very important. And, um, and, and after that, I think the stories that I wrote, I had a, I had a deeper mm -hmm. sense of, of um, responsibility with mm -hmm. them. What do you love about what you do? about a billion things, but, mm -hmm. but one, one of the main things that I love is that it is different every day. I am always learning and I'm able to share what I'm learning with, with an audience um, that, that often gives me feedback that they appreciate the information. Mm -hmm. So that's incredibly rewarding. Mm -hmm. I literally, I feel grateful every day. And as you've moved into taking over more anchor responsibilities, mm -hmm. what, what parts are you getting to do less that you really, really enjoy? Well, I love reporting mm -hmm. and I have covered hundreds of stories in this region during the time I've been at KCRA. I would say one thing that I really miss is the news gathering in the sense of whatever story that I was sent out to, I would always ask, so what else is going on? What else can you tell me? What mm -hmm. else should I know? And then I'd be able to come back to my newsroom that day or the next day with five good ideas in the assignment meeting. And I miss that vitality. You, mm -hmm. you know, if you're not out in the field and connecting with pe people from all walks of life, um, which I'm not as much anymore as an anchor, um, you just, it's harder to come up with great mm -hmm. ideas and... and mm -hmm. But you know, but the thing that you do get being an anchor is a, a, a daily connection with your audience. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the essence of the connection that your audience has with you? Uh, well, I hope it's trust. Mm -hmm. I hope it's trust. I hope that um, people know that I'm someone who has done my homework. I've been here for a long time. This is my home. I care about this community and I care about the people in it. And I, it, it, at the end of the day, I care about making sure everything that I put out there is, is correct and true and useful. Mm -hmm. What do you think might be, or at least just one of the misconceptions that most people have about the news business today from all of the commentary and and feedback that, that tends to swirl around, you know, just measuring local news. 
Right. Well, one of the questions that that just floors me every time I get it, and it you know fairly often, um, is some kind of sense that there is a wizard that just decides what is news, and that we all just go, follow these marching orders from some sort of central command. Um, that that usually when these questions come up, it has to do with news bias, and it's really? sort of, yeah, 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 and and the. And, and you know the political parties, especially uh, more on the conservative side. This is this is a message they put out there constantly. You watch Fox News, and and they will right. Essentially, they're invested in 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 putting out that message. Right, and and you know what what's really interesting about that is that you hear from the left that you know news is owned by these big mega corporations right. who are basically keeping the the real stories from all of us, so that. We're all pacified. And, and that's what I'm talking about. That's the wizard. Mm -hmm. That's the wizard I'm talking about. So yes, that's uh, that's probably the the biggest misperception that I would love for for some of these folks to come to our three o'clock assignment meeting when mm -hmm. we're hashing out what what stories we're going to cover and to see who's walking in with stories. It's really kind of anyone in the building. How we decide how to deploy our resources and you know we only have so many photographers and we only have so many reporters so how we triage and how we make those decisions I would love for more people to be involved with that. What do you think are some of the more interesting issues that uh, are coming up these days in terms of this region? What, what, what things do you say wow you know I hope we do a lot more reporting on that. You know Scott what's interesting about that is they have been the same issues from the day I got here. Really? We are still hashing them out. Like which ones? Well, okay, water. So so, so in, in terms of water, I would say here's water, too much, too little. And those are still uh, very passionate debates. What are we gonna do for flood control and levee protection? That issue is more relevant now than it's ever been, but it was hashed out just as passionately 15 years ago. Sure. And with as much fear from people who are living in zones where they wonder what's gonna happen with their homes if one of those levees fail. Um, to the issue of not enough water, and we're watching Governor Brown with just the latest proposal on bringing water down to Southern California and what to do with our fragile delta and the ecosystem there. These are not new issues, but they're critical issues and um, critical to lives, to property, to livelihoods. It doesn't get more profound in terms of a human story. So you might hear water policy, roll your eyes, water bond discussions tend to be dry, but at the end of the day, these are homeowners, these are farmers who are growing the food that we eat. I mean, these come down to some pretty basic human problems. And then on the other spectrum, you know, we have perennial issues that keep coming back up, like the Kings. Right. When I first moved to Sacramento, the city council had just approved a $77 million bailout for the team. At the same time, they decided they would not uh, help the symphony, so they let the symphony go, cut the kings, and I was just sort of watching all this as a newcomer to Sacramento. And, you know, 15, I don't know, 18 years later, hello, we're, we're talking about the same things. And to some degree, I think the kings are linked to our sense of identity mm -hmm. as a community. Mm -hmm. um, are striving to be a top tier city and how we define that. And so it's not, it's really not just about basketball and it's really not just about the Kings. I think it's its also Sacramento's ongoing discussion as to who we are. It's a, it's a struggle, which that you're right, that discussion keeps going on. And it, you know, if you ask what our brand is here in Sacramento, you'll get as many answers as, as the people that you ask. You know what answer I hate? What's that? It is, we're really close to really cool things. We're close to Tahoe, we're close to Napa, we're close to San Francisco. You know what, we're pretty great right here. Yeah. 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 So. And, and, and speaking of that, what are some of the things, you know, just uh, in, in your travels, uh, what are some of, from your perspective, our best kept secrets here? That you say, wow, you know, it's really cool that we've got this here. Well, it's interesting that you ask right now because my mom is visiting from Seattle and so we've been coming up with a list of fun things to do with her. Personally, 
and this may be from growing up the daughter of two marine biologists, I love to get outside and mm -hmm. it is really just so beautiful here. So we will be going to the FEA Nature Center area with my mom, we'll be going along the river trail. My husband, as you know, is an avid marathoner and does a lot of biking and um, just to get out in nature and it's right here. It is, people come to this part of, of our country from all over the world to experience the natural beauty of Northern California, and we get it every day, so. And, and the thing is, is that, you know, I think it must be true wherever it is that you live, that whatever you have that's special that people do travel for, you, you tend to ignore and take for granted. But um, in terms of, of branding, you're right. Many times it's talking about what we're not and what we're close to, yeah. rather than what we are. It, when, you, when you look at the what we are itself, wh what is it that, when you're out with your your husband Lloyd, your daughter, what things do you guys like to do? Where, where is it that you like to sort of experience, you know, some of the best of Sacramento? Well, so our daughter turns two next month, so that has kind of reined us in considerably. Ah. Uh -huh. uh, she's a lot of fun, but she's also um, just a pistol. She's <laughs> out and she's running around. So mm -hmm. the things that I like to do with 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 her are again, take her to places where she can just run around and explore. We go to the bike trail all the time. Oh. And she is as happy just picking up sticks and rocks and leaves and looking at those as, as taking her to Disneyland. At this, at this age, it's all the same. So right. and she, she loves being out. And um, we've recently adopted a dog. So just, just getting out and, and letting her get her hands in the dirt. Sure. Yeah. As uh, as we start, as we continue to grow and evolve as a region, one of the things that the, is the purpose of the news is not only to inform us, but in some ways to to bring us together. Uh, do you see that um, in this age of all of this technology, where it is that newspapers are online and you're available by video and things like that, is it getting harder to reach? the audience or, or is this technology actually making it easier? Well, I would say both are true depending on how you're looking at that question. So on one hand, for every TV station, every network, we know that viewership is declining. That is just a fact. And it's in large part because there there are so many platforms, there are, there's so many ways to get information now um, that you've just kind of spread the same sure. number of viewers across a greater number of channels and venues and all of that. But at the same time, it, it's, it's um, fantastic for KCRA.com to be able to put out instant alerts. That's how I found out this morning, for instance, that we lost an ambassador in Libya. That was through my phone. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't have to turn on the television to get that information because KCRA.com sent a bulletin straight to the mm -hmm. place where I would see it immediately. And uh, of course, as a reporter, that kind of immediacy and being able to share information um, through all kinds of platforms is really exciting. It's really, it's fantastic when you only get a minute and a half for a TV news story to say all the documents in this case, the links to other sites, a whole bunch more information, maybe if it's a domestic violence story, the full list of things that you can do to protect yourself, that's all online. Wow. You can put vast amount of resources and a vast amount of depth on your website. Um, whereas, of course, with TV news, you're limited by time, so. Well, you know, it, <clears throat> you, you actually raise a point that I've read about recently, uh, that in fact, the news pyramid has inverted and that 25, 30 years ago, the national news networks really commanded the mind share of the American people. Mm -hmm. But that because of all of these different platforms being available, that in fact, the common touchstone, the, the Walter Cronkite or the Barbara Walters now uh, plat news platform of today is really local news, not national news. And that in fact, most people if they're going to watch news, they're going to get it from stations like KCRA rather than watching Brian Williams on on the national newscast. Any reaction to that? I think that part of that trend has focused us even more on our mission and doing it well. 
because you can go online and tune in anywhere for national news, and there are a lot of organizations that do a good job at it. What can we do the best? We can cover our backyard. Mm -hmm. We can do the very, very best job at that, and also, um, when you talk about all of the different just places that people can get news, I think there's also a, a hopefully, there's a good amount of cynicism mm -hmm. as to where that information is coming from, who's putting it out and why. And um, they know that when they're getting that information from KCRA, that we have vetted the information and that it's something that they can trust. So mm -hmm. that's something that, that we can own that right now. And it, I think it, in a more focused way than maybe we've had to in the past. Right. In our final moments, Edie, I wanted to ask you, when you, since you have a small ch a child, a small daughter, when you get the occ occasional date night to go out <laughs> with your husband Lloyd, what do you guys like to do in our last 30 seconds? Well, Lloyd is on the board of the B Street Theater, and that is our date night. We have season tickets. We go to every single show on the main stage. We usually try to go on second Saturday, so we go and we'll hit a couple art galleries, have dinner, go see a 9 o'clock play, and that's, that's a pretty ideal date night for us. Sounds pretty good to me. Yeah. Edie, thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you, Scott. And much success to thank you. Thank you. Well, that's our show. Thanks to Edie Lambert for joining us and thanks to you for watching. For Studio Sacramento, I'm Scott Syfax. See you next time right here on KVIE. I'm James Beckwith, President and CEO of Five Star Bank. As a community bank, we believe that open dialogue about the issues affecting our region is vitally important. From the economy to the environment to social issues, we look forward to the conversations and hope you'll join in.